women with, uh, about marriage. When I speak to men about marriage, it's an addition. I mean, I ask them to do additional relational things. When I speak to women, it's a subtraction. I ask them to do a little less uh, relational uh, duties and a little more self-care. And we'll see some of that later in the presentation. Usually like to start off with a little joke. So uh, one I like to tell about marriage. My state president actually told me this a number of years ago, not in the state. So um, there's a, a type of couples, they're called volatile couples. They like to fight, debate. Very active, fun couples, but they get in the bickering a lot. And um, so this one couple was a volatile couple and they ended up about their 10th fight in the, last, in the last month and about some silly thing again. Finally, the wife threw up her hands in frustration and said, all right, if I can prove I'm the smarter person, will you let me win these fights and we can just get past this? And the problem says, so he says, of course, rolling his eyes. How are you going to prove that? Just, just promise me if I can prove this that you'll let me win these fights. He says, OK, fine. She says, look who I married and look who you married. <laughs> Definitely the smarter person. <laughs> You can only use that once in your marriage, by the way. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about how to, how to improve uh, your marriage along with everyone else's. This might seem a little odd about thinking about improving other people's marriages, but we actually don't talk about marriage much anymore. It's, it's um, out of um, character. It's not um, appreciated by a lot of people because we all know uh, people in our own families have struggled with their marriages. Many have experienced divorce or are single or never married. And so there's a variety of circumstances and we don't want to add to their difficulties and, and trauma and such. And so we just don't talk about marriage. And we need to talk about marriage a lot because marriage is in trouble. And uh, we have some really great solutions to help um, the, the chances of divorce be very, very small. And, uh, and we need to start teaching our children about those strengths so they have a perspective of faith toward marriage rather than a perspective of fear. So uh, each one of us can be an emissary for marriage, and we, need, and we need to be an emissary for marriage. So let's start out here. Basic premise is um, a successful marriage is one of those, uh, those that's both stable, meaning it lasts, and that it is satisfying to each partner. While everyone does not currently have a successful marriage, the Lord's promises are sure if we repent and endure to the end, everyone can enjoy a successful eternal marriage. Sometimes people feel like if their marriage didn't work and they got a divorce or they've never been married, that the promises that they read about, about eternal families are not available to them. The prophets have been 100% clear on this. You, you, you can't sin beyond the pale in terms of marriage. If your marriage didn't work and it broke, broke down and you're not married anymore, you can repent. Uh, not that it was your fault necessarily that your marriage fell apart, but you can still be a person of faith and the promises of the Lord uh, about eternal families are yours. Uh, we don't know the timing of those promises. We don't know when you might have that eternal family, but we know that every single person can achieve this goal. Um, we can do many things as individuals, families, and communities to strengthen marriage. So basically, you have three main areas that can help you um, with marriage success. One is what happens to you and your family, the preparation you get as you're growing up can help you be a good marriage partner. Another is the support you get from your community. For example, um, people in our faith who uh, marry in the temple and stay active, their chances of divorce are very, very low. And one of the central reasons for that is because, of course, we emphasize marriage, and so they believe strongly in that they're committed to it, but they get strong community support. And it works, it actually helps. So that's a simple example of how the community can support marriage. And then, of course, the thing that we generally focus on most when we talk about marriage is healthy practices of marriage. These are very easy to remember. There are four C's. Just remember the four C's and do them in order. Well, at least the first one. Um, the, the, the others can go in any order, but that first one about self-care, um, we'll talk about extensively. So, let's start out with the family dimension. One of the things that we know, those of us that teach your youth in college, we find consistently that they're neurotic about marriage. Way more neurotic than we were. 
people my age especially, but even people a little younger than me. We, we entered marriage believing it was going to work. We had a, a sort of perspective of faith and belief. Today, most of the youth enter marriage with fear. And so uh, fear is not a great foundation for starting marriage on. And we need to do all that we can to help counteract that. And so I'll give you a couple of words on that. Uh, parents are, and other family members are key to helping them t turn from a uh, perspective of fear towards marriage to a perspective of faith. Love is the key, of course. Uh, children have to see and feel love all around them in their family so that they think about family as a loving place. But sometimes we misinterpret that to mean we can't ever have fights and we can't ever have difficulties and disagreements, and we know those are common in families. It's not about only love, but it's about getting back to love as frequently as we can. And especially getting back to love when we've had disagreements so that children learn what does repentance and forgiveness look like in a family relationship. And this is particularly important in today's climate, uh, and I'm going to show you why in a minute here. We do not want to cocoon our children. One of the things we often find in highly religious communities is you try to cocoon your children, which means you isolate them from the world. And so then when they launch off to college and go away from your home, they're overwhelmed by the crazy world that they haven't been exposed to before. A much healthier way is to pre-arm them. So talk to them about the way marriages are or aren't working in the world. Talk to them about the trends out there in relationships. Help them have strategies and understand why the way we teach about marriage is likely to bring more happiness and a better chance of good marriage, rather than, again, trying to keep them from being exposed to these things. Since time immemorial, marriage has been seen as a reproductive unit designed to foster healthy creation and development of children. This has been the definition of marriage for thousands of years. It isn't anymore. And this is the first time this has ever happened in history, and it's shaking up a lot of things around relationships. Um, so the adversary has attacked this definition and has succeeded largely by, for the majority of the people. They no longer think of marriage as a place where sexuality should be exclusively experienced, and they no longer think of marriage as a place where children, that is the sort of foundational place for children. And this is God's kind of grief in our world. And again, we can be emissaries for the traditional approach to these things, and we can help people who are struggling with the ways that don't work very well see an alternative. Um, so <clears throat> we have seen more changes in the last 50 years in the dating, courtship, and family life processes than in the entire history of the world combined. These changes are revolutionary, and most of them are not good. The only good trend we have seen in terms of marriage is teenage marriages are less likely to occur. That's it. All the rest of the trends are negative. And uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this and get depressed, and you don't need more of that. But we'll spend a little bit on this. So we still are at historically high divorce rates. Uh, fortunately, they have come down from about 47 to 48 to about 40%. 40% is still a pretty high divorce rate, uh, historically. Um, uh, currently, 80% of couples cohabit prior to marriage, so almost all couples. When you talk to people outside of our faith about not cohabiting, they think you're insane. They literally think you're insane. What? You're not going to live with them first? How can you know whether it's compatible or not? So this idea is embedded deeply in youth today. The average person before they get married has had seven same sexual partners. This is causing all kinds of trouble and in and outside of marriage. Um, and this number is slowly inching up. Um, the majority of children born to women younger than 30 are born in a family where the parents are not married. So that prime childbearing years of the 20s, most of those children now that the majority are not born in, in a married unit. Sometimes it turns into a married unit. It's often a cohabiting unit, but, um, but most of them are not. And this, this, um, so this is creating a lot of difficulty for children because of the instability. Birth rates are at non-replaceable levels in almost all developed countries. We're very close in the United States to dipping below replacement 
rates. We're the last of the developed countries to, to reach that. Nobody's having children, period. And if they're having them, they're not having them in marriage. So these are just a simple, a quick example of some of the things that are happening in terms of these relationships that we need to be talking to our children about. We need to be um, helping others uh, think about a different way of doing things because it isn't working. This is a really quick, um, it's a little hard to see those letters, but we won't spend more than a minute or two on this. The top set of boxes are what it's looked like. This should be very familiar to most of you. Those are the, that's the process you follow for marriage. You get attracted to somebody, you go on a date, you become boyfriend and girlfriend, you get engaged, married, then you start your sexual relationship, and then you have children. That's the way it's been forever. This is the way it is now by most couples. You're attracted to somebody, you start with sex, and then you hang out, and you see maybe if there's a relationship that's going to happen. Then at some point you define the relationship, and then you decide to cohabit because you're still not sure. And then a child comes along, and that's okay. And then uh, eventually you get engaged and get married. The process is generally four to six years for most people, if you're lucky. And uh, versus the top pattern is usually about six to, uh, to two years, six months to two years. Um, so that's, that's the change. In fact, it's very rare now to find a person that's not a member of a highly religious community who doesn't have sex within the first two weeks of meeting somebody. So that shift alone changes everything. It changes a lot. Uh, and so again, let your kids know about this. Let your kids know what's going on out there. Uh, teach them about the traditional way we approach marriage and why we teach it and how it can strengthen their potential marriage. Um, it teach them to expect pressure to engage in sex very early in the dating experience. They have, even in Happy Valley, um, either with people of the same or the opposite sex. Right now in this valley, the numbers of kids in high school experimenting with same-sex behavior is at all-time historical highs. Somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of kids are experimenting. We've never seen this before. Being pansexual, bisexual, fluid is, a, is the end thing to do for kids that are a little bit on the edge right now. And so you have to pre-arm them for these kinds of patterns. Start talking to them way before they're in high school. So they know what kind of pressures they'll, they'll hear and help, help them understand why this is important to avoid. Let's go on from here. Then you, uh, this, this is what I try to do is shift when I teach uh, in my classes about marriage at UI, I try to shift the central thing to uh, this idea that divorce is high. When, when I ask them when they first start in the semester, what's your chance of getting the divorce? And most of them say yeah, about 50%. Well, that's absolutely not true. Your chances of divorce in your community, the way you're living, are actually very, very low. Let me show you an example. These are some things I share with them. Come on, let's go on here. Okay, seven ways to make divorce highly unlikely without even treating your partner better. <laughs> of course, we know that treating your partner better is the best way to make divorce unlikely. Put it in your mouth and really slowly let it melt. And you don't go fast. It's very slow, pay close attention to the players, etc. And it's teaching you to pay attention to your body sensations. And so uh, that because I learned that, I have this high-end chocolate around, and I eat a, a piece of that every day, and when I eat it fast, I know I'm not in a mindful place. You just cannot waste high-end chocolate by eating it fast. You might as well eat a Hershey's wax bar, you know, it's just if you're gonna do that. Besides the fact that it costs nine dollars a bar, you you know you, you, you just can't. And so it's a it's a nice trigger for me when I eat that chocolate fast. I'm not in a mindful place in my life. Uh, the other thing about uh, uh, you know physical activity is super important for us in terms of self care, um, and it's the best way that sisters can help. I run into them literally with my dog and the bike on the pathway in Mapleton all the time. Uh, sisters running together, walking together, hiking together, um, just be active. And what we what we know about people with young children is that it's difficult to carve out time for physical activity regularly. So you have to multitask. 
Um, and, uh, and usually that means that you have to engage with your children in a park, or you have to use the time to connect with your husband, to walk together, um, or you're, you're doing your ministry while you're out jogging together, something like that. Combining something that else that you have to do with physical activity is really a fabulous way of doing a couple of things. And by the way, uh, there are a number of mindfulness activities that you can do while walking and jogging. Um, and so some people do their mindfulness while they're also giving you know, 10 to 20 minutes of exercise a day. Uh, so these two things, this centering your life, engaging in physical activity regularly, what that does is it, it reduces some of that chronic stress in your life because you get a hold of at least a few minutes of your day. And you can plan out some things that you're going to do in your day or you hope to get to. And it changes your mindset. Even though you might not be removing a lot of your, your details, uh, and your, your duties, it, it helps. Uh, okay, the second C besides self-care is um, commitment. This one should be pretty uh, straightforward. Most, I find, members of our faith are highly committed to marriage. Marriage, I've noticed some of them can last a long time in a pretty difficult marriage. And guess what? It gets better. Even if you don't do a lot, you just hold on. Um, it will get better. The tides go in and the tides go out of marriage. Um, and so uh, what we know is that couples who make marriage their top priority in life, um, even a higher priority than children, they have shorter times of marital neglect, they endure the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs of life in other areas, um, and they're much better than, uh, they're, they're much less likely to divorce. Other than your relationship with God, is marriage your top priority? Um, so basically commitment is this daily decision that leads to an eternal marriage. Here's some science. One of the interesting things we've discovered in the last couple of years is kissing. Think about your kisses with your partner. Is there any romance left in those kisses? Is it just the peck on the cheek as you leave? Is that the only kind of kiss left in your marriage? There's no energy in your kisses. It might be time to work on some things there. Um, do you go out? One of the things that I like about that, that clip with the Fosters is they had this conversation about their marriage because they went out on a date even when they didn't want to. Just getting out forces you to be together and have these conversations eventually even if you neglect the relationship. Um, and so uh, the, the key thing with engagement in this way is, is, is uh, the, the sort of third thing to think about in terms of commitment. Are you regularly uh, talking about your lives, your fears, your successes, your struggles? In other words, is the time that you have together being used to engage in some of that emotional work that you need to do to stay connected? Okay, third, third C is connection. Um, this is, uh, couples are spending more time together than ever before in the same physical space. This is really interesting stuff. Uh, in fact, you have more than twice as much time together in the same house as couples in the heydays of the 50s and 60s. But you're not talking more. You're, you're physically together more, but you're not talking more. And it looks like mostly you're spending time in front of screens. Um, so, uh, so you'll have to monitor. We used to say when when I first started, I've been I've been learned, uh, doing research on marriage for over 35 years now. When I first started doing marriage, there was a little saying that if you put a TV in your room, your sex life is over. Um, meaning screens are bad for your connection, right? Your physical sexual connection. Well, now we carry around our TVs in our pockets, and so um, we're having an even harder time separating out that world from the connected world that we need to have with one another. So you may need to start, your, if you feel your relationship is growing distant, with talking together about how you're going to manage screen time and, and what you can do to spend more time engaged together rather than in the same space. So the, the author of that study that, that's found that couples were together more than ever before but speaking less, he called that alone together. Um, which I think is a great way of thinking about a lot of marriages today. A lot of time alone, even though 
there together physically. Couples typically spend three to five hours a week engaged in connective activities. These are, these are happy couples. Such as talking, going out to dinner, sexuality, exercising, sharing a hobby together, etc. Uh, they're, they're also those that typically report the best relationship satisfaction, sexual satisfaction, and life satisfaction to so their overall life. It's three to five hours. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's spread out over the week, and especially if you go out, you know, spend a couple hours doing something on a date, um, you know, there's two hours right there, and then you can just neglect your relationship the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know what I'm saying. It, it, it's not as much as you think. You know, 15 minutes here, engaging with one another, um, spending a little time here and there, it, it's three to five hours. And this is the thing. I teach young single adults, if you want to increase your chances of getting married, take those same five hours. Spend them engaged in being in relationships out there with other people. Three to five hours a week in relational work. That's what this is. Everybody should be spending three to five hours in relational work, regardless of your relationship status. And it will make a difference. So just think of the last few weeks. Have you spent three to five hours a week engaged with your partner, not just being in the same room, but actually engaged in your relationship? So that's a good sort of question to think about. Fourth one is communication, but especially a particular type of communication, and that's conflict. We know that human beings have what we call a negativity bias. So when we have really destructive uh, fights with people that we love, it, it's hard for us to not remember them. It traumatizes us to a degree. And, and so it takes five positives to one of those negatives to sort of compensate for that. And so when you think about your communication, one of the areas that you really want to think about addressing, if you if need be, is how you communicate during conflict. Most couples communicate really well when they're not in a fight, of course. Um, and, and, but it's when that tension um, emerges. And so, um, during times of disagreement and conflict is the most important type of communication, it will lead more quickly to marital distress and divorce than any other thing that can happen to you. This is what we know about gender. Men, when they get overworked and stressed, they go inside and they go, they neglect relationships. That's why it's always a plus when I talk to them about marriage. Add something. You're going in your cage, you're not engaging with your family. Engage, engage, engage. Women, when they get highly stressed and overwhelmed, they get critical. So uh, you're engaging, but it's turning into negative. And typically, they're getting critical because they've been neglected. They don't feel like they matter anymore. They've made soft noise, they've made appropriate noise, it hasn't mattered, their spouse isn't paying attention, so then they just turn it off. And, and they start making negative noise. And of course, that isn't going to help, but it, feel, it does relieve a little bit of their frustration. Um, and of course, you could, be, uh, you could be different than the typical male and female here. One of you might, as a female, may be the one that sort of goes away and is more introverted. Um, it doesn't really matter. Whatever your pattern is, how do you, how do you deal with conflict together? So pay attention first. The first thing to do with this, this negative communication to make it less likely is pay attention to these brief, subtle bids for connection. So this is the interesting thing about men and women again. In, in the typical dinner conversation, couples spend about, they send about 50 to 60 bids for a connection. These are very small things, like just looking at each other with a smile on your face. That's a bid for connection. If your partner smiles back, you've made the connection. Or just touching your, your partner on the shoulder as you go by, just touching them like that, rubbing their shoulders like that. You touch their hand, that's a bid that they've given and you've made a connection. So we're not talking about sitting down and having this deep conversation about all this stuff going on in your life. They're small, subtle bits. This is the interesting thing about women. Even in marriages that end up divorcing, in a typical dinner conversation, they continue to pay attention to about 80% of the bids. Men, pay attention to about 40% in those marriages that have been divorced. So they stop engaging. And so that's this, that's this thing. So it's OK to remind yourself, hey, John, I just asked you something. You didn't even acknowledge I was in the room. Wake up. Uh, you know, you can do that once in a while. Um, 
of course, if you're doing that all evening, that's a problem. Uh, but, but anyway, you can get to the point. Um, learning to begin difficult conversations where problems are addressed with what's called a soft startup is very important. So it's the difference between a complaint and a criticism. So let's say that your spouse is notoriously late and you've let them know this is very upsetting to you many times. So once again, at your child's most important concert of the year, they show up late. So you're steaming. And so afterwards, you're going to criticize because you're angry. So you say, why are you always late? You're so irresponsible. Okay, that's, that's a criticism, right? The components of a criticism are you use LDS swear words, always and never, right? <laughs> and that you make it a character flaw. You're so irresponsible. So now they're late. It's not about being late, and that's now they're basically an irres irresponsible person. And, and so that's a criticism. Just change it to a complaint. I'm very frustrated that you were late, and that was a very important thing. I wanted you to be there on time. That's a complaint. You can start and move into difficult topics way better if it starts with a complaint rather than a criticism. So just check yourself when, especially when you're very frustrated, you know, and you know you want to criticize, go to a complaint instead. Uh, taking timeouts when you get flooded. We know couples get flooded. The, one of the worst pieces of advice that used to be given over the temple altars all the time is never go to bed angry. Go to bed angry. <laughs> Because the best way to relieve being flooded is to sleep. And then you'll come at it in a very in a better way. Once you get flooded, it takes 20 to 30 minutes for you to have a reasonable conversation. You know what flooded feels like. You know when you want to strangle your partner. <laughs> You're flooded. It's time to just disengage. And you know when your partner is flooded too, but it doesn't help say, You're flooded, go away. <laughs> to say, you know, you go away, even if it's because you really know your partner right now is pretty I think we just need to stop right now. I just need to take a break and come back. Um, and so, you know, recognize those points because when we get flooded, that's when we turn, we get mean. And that's where those negative experiences can, can scar. And scars are harder to overcome, of course. We know they, 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 they so. So anyway, um, let's, let's begin to wrap up here. Basically, uh, we want to apply Christianity to our marriage. I went back as I was preparing for this and I read the, the most recent um, talk by Elder Nelson on um, spiritual amendment. What a fabulous talk for improving your relationship. If you apply that talk to relationships, take any relationship in your family that isn't where you want it to be, and apply those principles to that relationship. It's just a fabulous uh, template for that. So um, here's a couple of quotes from that. I repeat my call to end the conflicts in your life, exercise humility, courage, and strength required both to forgive and to seek forgiveness. Another one, sorry. Um, with frightening speed, a testimony, and, and I put this in, for example, on eternal marriage, that is not nourished daily by the good word of God can crumble. I plead with you to let God prevail in your life. Give him a fair share of your time. So just think, go, go to that talk. It's just a really fabulous talk about how to improve the relationship in your uh, Last two real quick slides. So uh, love is the key, of course. Um, Elder Worthen said the measure of our love is the measure of the greatness of our souls. We come to this faith to get hope. The purpose of religion is not to add burdens to our life. It's not to help to make it heavier or harder. It's to give us hope. And of course, Christ won our souls with love so that we can be surrounded by love. It can be in us, it can be around us, it can be through us. That love, is, it's, it's here, it's right here. All we have to do is access that love. And when we act out of that Christ-like love towards our family members, then it makes all the difference in the world. Um, you're already good at loving. We know women in this faith are good at loving. Sometimes you get overwhelmed, and it's difficult to express when you're, when you're overwhelmed and you're fatigued. So always start, if you feel that way, if it's hard to express love, if you're feeling more conflictual, you're feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, depressed, whatever the feeling is, it's not love. Start with self-care first, 
and then move into some of those connective activities and the spirit can help you. Okay, final thoughts. It'll take a miracle to make marriage work. I've often thought it's a miracle that I found a person that can live with me. I'm not easy to live with. Ask her. Um, and, uh, but she loves me. And you're hard to get along with too, by the way. Each one of you. You are. Every single one of you can make your spouse crazy. Um, and it's going to take a miracle for them to stick with you. And guess what? This is the great thing. We're in this church and we believe in a God of miracles. And we really believe in a God. Look at this quote from that same talk. Do the spiritual work to seek miracles. Prayerfully ask God to help you exercise the kind of faith. I promise you that you can experience for yourself that Jesus Christ giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Few things will accelerate your spiritual movement more than realizing the Lord is helping you to move the mountain in your life. Sometimes those mountains are in relationships. Often they're in relationships. God is always in the middle of every marriage that invites him to be. He's always in the middle. He wants marriage to succeed. And he will come and he will help you in amazing ways. Usually he will help you see your family members the way he sees them. He will soften your heart and bring more love into those you know, experiences. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Any quick questions? A few minutes. Are there any good blended family classes to be taken? This is what I tell people about Stephanie. That's a, that's a, you've, you're taking on a very important and challenging situation in a blended family. The first year is the hardest relational thing you can do, especially for teenage kids. This is hard. If you can get through the first year, um, it's going to get better usually. But um, Tammy and Jeff Hill sometimes teach a course. Uh, it's uh, in the evenings in the fall on step families. Uh, unfortunately, I do not, I'm not up on the literature on set numbers. I do not have a source in the top of my head that I would recommend for, for step numbers. Um, I just don't, it's, nothing's going to be mine. But, uh, but they're a good place to start. They have a blended family. Both lost their spouses to death, and, and they have like, I don't know, 20 kids now because they brought them down. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they have some stuff in there. Any other questions? What was the name of that talk? Which one? Uh, Spiritual Momentum. It was the one he gave April conference uh, Sunday morning. Yeah, great, fantastic time. Okay, thank you.